several weeks. Next week, we're going to share books. We've done this about once a year, I think. Uh, and this has been uh, quite a very enlightening uh, meeting. I think last year, we actually spent two, two Sabbaths doing that, didn't we? And I know uh, Ron Graybill was able to get it so that we could able to uh, look these books up. And then in December 3 and December 10, uh, Leo Ranzman is going to be speaking on unity and diversity in the New Testament. And so I know we'll be looking forward to that. And then also, is Sigby going to be speaking again? You said it? The last three weeks of the month. Last three weeks of December, so uh, mark that on your calendar. Okay. Uh, a few announcements. First of all, David, would you like to mention about the program tonight at the University of Redlands? Yes. Uh, at the University of Redlands tonight, there will be an event in, one does not say in honor of, but in remembrance of the San Bernardino shootings, almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so at the University of Redlands, at the Ortner Center, uh, Professor Miroslav Wolf, who teaches at Yale Divinity School, and is a colleague of Lynn Tonstad, who is our own Sigma Tonstad's daughter. <coughs> so that's how we know him, right? Uh, so Miroslav Wolf will be speaking tonight at 7.30. He's well known because of his book, Exclusion and Embrace, which is a book about how people in Croatia and Serbia uh, needed to have some reconciliation. Much more frequently, much more recently, he's written a book called Flourishing, and that book is being widely read. This book comes out of a course at Yale that he taught with Tony Blair. Tony Blair and Miroslav Wolf taught a course on human flourishing at Yale Divinity School, and the book uh, that is with that title, Flourishing, is widely read now, very recently published. So he will be speaking tonight at the Ortner Center at 7.30. My understanding is there is no entrance fee. I am anticipating a large group because this is put on by the uh, Inland Empire Ecumenical uh, Association. I don't know exactly what it's named, but that's the group that's doing it. So, tonight, 7.30 at the Ortner Center, University of Redlands, Miroslav Wolf. Croatian, isn't it? You said he's a Croatian. But yes, but then uh, they were in tight uh, conflict with the Serbians, weren't That's, they? Oh yeah, yeah. And so, and his father is a Pentecostal minister. So he's he grew up a Pentecostal and is now a theologian at Yale. Yeah, well, so hey. there's hope for everybody. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if you can't make it to that, the book club tonight at Michael Orlich's place, we're discussing the book Facing Doubt. And I really, after listening, who's the speaker going to be over there? I kind of hate to say who's going to be presenting the book, me. <laughs> so, uh, but you get a free meal with ours. You get the spinach <laughs> lasagna. It's a vegan meal. Well, probably. <laughs> I asked Michael if uh, I could bring a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, he didn't seem to be excited about that. <laughs> so, anyway, but again, so our uh, speaker today and our Minuteman is going to be David Larson, who's going to speak on inspiration and we are going to bring uh, you know I only have struggle with your name because I have a I know a Stacy Graham not Graham Stacy no not Graham Stacy so I have to stop and think Charles Carroll who used to be on CBS said that an inordinate amount of presidents of higher institutions had names which could be either first or last so I am sure that there's a presidency waiting for you somewhere. <laughs> uh, probably a prime ministership. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we look forward to He will actually do the last uh, segment of our book of future Adventism. So at this time, I'm going to turn this over to David. And uh, you can have our prayer. And then thank you, David, for stepping okay. in. Let's pray as we begin. Dear God, thank you for Graham, thank you for all the work he has done on this project from which we will eventually benefit. Thank you for all the work he does day by day for our students in the School of Dentistry and elsewhere. He's been a great blessing to us and continues to be, and we are grateful for that. In Christ's name, amen. I think Graham came first to Loma Linda when? 
Oh my goodness. Uh, mid 80s. Okay. And then went back. Then returned. Then mid 90s. And went back. And came back in the mid 2000s. And will eventually go back. <laughs> so it's been a long journey. And I think I helped you change degree programs. You did. Graham came to the United States to study one thing, and I thought that was great, but I thought it would be even greater if he did a different degree, which took him longer, and it was more uh, involved with research, but I'm, I'm glad he did that. It's, uh, and he's serving now um, in the School of Dentistry as one of the deans, particularly for student affairs, right? Okay, so, we will hear later from, from Graham because we want to benefit from all the hard work he's done on this presentation. This gives me a chance to talk with you a little bit about the idea of inspiration. That idea has been threading its way through all of our discussions and I've been thinking some about it and I would like to offer some proposals like Thomas Aquinas would, one, two, three, four, five, okay? and um, we'll see how this turns out. The first suggestion I would like to make is that the notion of inspiration is tightly woven with the idea of authority, which itself is very questionable. Okay, three points. Inspiration, authority, questionable. The reason why I think we have these debates about inspiration is that we want to establish that some text has authority, and why do we want to make sure the text has authority? Because we want it to use it to get other people to do what we want them to do. That's the whole point, right? If we weren't uh, worried about other people doing what we want them to do, we wouldn't worry so much about inspiration, we wouldn't worry so much about authority. I do not have in my library a bunch of books labeled inspired, and another bunch of books labeled not inspired, right? That, I think, is not a helpful way to go. And I notice that in our discussions in the church, uh, we go, often we go so far, and then someone will say, well, you don't really believe the Bible, because if you did, you'd see it my way. <laughs> well, see, that, I think, is an unfortunate uh, stopper to the conversation. And therefore, for all practical purposes, I believe we should set aside the whole notion of authority and start talking more and more about evidence and forms of reasoning and make our case on the basis of the evidence, not by appeals to authority. However, however, since we do use authority so much and since that is linked to the notion of inspiration, we move on. Second point, God is omnipresent. In my view, we can't begin to think about the notion of inspiration unless we begin with the notion of God being omnipresent. And the two texts that I like most on this are first from the speech of Paul to the people <coughs> at Athens on Mars Hill where he talks about God as the one in whom we live and move and have our being. The one in whom we live and move and have our being. That word, en, in Greek could also be translated by. So it could mean the one by whom we live and move and have our being. And people get into tug of wars as to whether it should be in or by. Why not say it's both? Because it is in fact both. We live by God's grace and power, but we are enveloped in God's being um, and God is enveloped in us. So, uh, that's, that's a view of things that I think we need to talk a little bit more about. The other text is the one in Romans 8 where Paul says, in everything God works for good. The other way of translating that would be to say, God works for good, uh, all things work together for good. Right, but that's not, those two are equally valid translations linguistically, so one tips the balance one way or the other theologically. And I think experience suggests that things don't always work out as we think should be good, and even from an eternal perspective, I doubt that even from God's perspective, everything turns out the way 
God had hoped that to do. So, but I think there's something very profound about what Paul is saying here, uh, and that is, in every moment of every life, God is an influence working toward the maximum amount of, amount of health and healing available at that moment. In every moment of every life. All right? That's, somebody's going to say, that's pantheism. Not quite. It's panentheism. If one follows, I think, F Philip Clayton's best book, we have read some of his more popular books here, but if we read one of his most scholarly book, he traces the idea of God from the Enlightenment with Spinoza on down to the present. And he points out that Spinoza begins with pantheism, uh, such that for pantheism, uh, Spinoza means the right thing. Pantheism means the universe and God are identical. So if you drew a circle around God, you drew a circle around the universe, they are the same thing. But Philip Clayton shows that as the generations of thinkers moved through this idea, generation after generation after generation, it became increasingly clear just on philosophical grounds that that wasn't the best way to think about God. We ought not to think of God as utterly separated from us, but um, we ought to think about God's actuality as greater than the universe as a whole. So panentheism says all is in God and God is in all, and God is not identical with either the universe, God is not identical with the universe. <clears throat> God is greater than the universe. Some people would say there's a rough analogy between the human mind and the human body with God's actuality and the universe's actuality. Now let's be very clear about this. This means there never was a time, if panentheism is correct, and I think at least some forms of it are, there never was a time when God was home alone. God was always interacting with some creation other than God's own self. And I think that that is part of thinking of God's love is constantly overflowing. Now a colleague like mine, like Rick, of mine, like Rick Rice, would say that within the Trinity there is this sufficient uh, expression of love that we need not posit a universe outside of God, a universe of some sort outside of God. But I see that differently. It seems to me that 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 uh, that runs very closely to tritheism, and we ought to stay away from that. And that genuine love always overflows to the other. So, in some way, according to panentheism, in some way, God has been uh, creating something everlastingly. All right. Now. What does that mean? Next step. Given the notion of divine omnipresence, that means every living thing is inspired. There are no living beings that are not inspired. No, I mean more than in breath. I mean That's as... What the word means, inspired. Right, but I mean inspired as the power that works for as much good as possible at that juncture in that organism's life. Now, what to... To just detour a little bit on this, uh, let's think about a moment of experience like process theologians would think about it. Think of any moment just like that. The process theologians would ask us, well, what goes into that moment? And they would say, everything that has happened from the Big Bang onto the present to that very moment is rushing in like a river to that very moment. Uh, in addition to that, however, there is the influence of God. And that influence of God is tugging at that organism to move in a more positive direction. Thirdly, that organism has some degree of freedom, vanishingly small as we go down the scale of life, but never as long as we're talking about living beings wholly absent. So, the organism has some capacity to respond favorably to or unfavorably to the influence of God in its own life. Now, if you're thinking about it, maybe this is just only by, as they say, per hypothesis, right? Uh, if what we know best is our own lives, and then we posit there's no dualism, so it has to be uh, in gradations all the way down to whatever's at the bottom. But in every moment of every life, God is at work. Now, I think we should take this very, very seriously, because that means in every moment of my life, 
God is trying to help me make as much of that moment and the subsequent ones as at all possible, given where I am at that juncture. There are a lot of things that are not available to me because I was born in a certain place, certain time, I made some decisions, some of them were good, some of them were bad. All of that's taken into account. All of the whole history of the universe is moving into this moment, but there's also God, and God is influencing us, and um, we have some capacity to respond. How did this come up with process theologians? Remember, Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell were friends and colleagues. And at a certain point, Bertrand Russell became one of the most articulate atheists of the 20th century, and Alfred North Whitehead become, became one of the most articulate theists. All right. Why did Whitehead figure out that he had to come up with this idea of God? And he did so simply on the basis of his reflection on the matter, and this is where Russell and, uh, Birch, uh, and Whitehead parted company. Whitehead said, I cannot account for evolution without some understanding of God. Otherwise, randomness would just produce randomness endlessly. But there is some directionality, he thought, to the history of the universe, and that without positing some powerful force tugging at the universe, uh, pulling it in uh, positive directions, uh, evolution would not be possible. Now that's how he that's how he, he arrived at that. But I don't think we have to arrive at that uh, moment, that truth, that way. I think in other ways we can come to the conclusion that God is at work in every moment of every life. And that therefore that means things are inspired. Everything is inspired in the sense that in that organism God is working for good. David? I'm sorry, I probably wandered into this class by mistake. I don't know what process theology is. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let me show, this is an aneurysm, okay, <laughs> a philosophical aneurysm, but let me, let me just stop there. Uh, the simplest definition of process theolo theology is that this, it tries to overcome the static view of things we find in Aristotle and the dualistic things we find in Descartes. So let's talk about both things. We know that as we look around ourselves and within ourselves, we see that which changes and that which does not change, right? Aristotle said the most important of those, the most real of those, is that which is not changing. Process thought turns that upside down. It says the most pervasive and true thing of the universe is that everything is always changing. So we move from a static view of things to a dynamic view of things. That's what the process. No, that's what the process notion means. And then, on the other hand, hand, Descartes, as we know, split mind and matter, what he called extended substance and um, thinking substance, mind and matter. And ever since Descartes did it, the history of Western philosophy is a vain attempt to put them back together again. And you. So on one hand. So you have man, mind on the one hand and matter on the other hand. And so over time what you have is a number of idealists who will say the mental is supreme and um, original and that the material is secondary and derivative. Okay, so just like we were talking about the uh, change and staticness, now we're talking about mind and matter. And so a whole bunch of thinkers like Hegel, like uh, Kant, help me Peter, all the, all the idealists all the way down, they're saying, well, given Descartes' split between mind and matter and our inability to integrate them, we are going to say that mind is the more, that our capacity to think, that's what's the most real thing about us. The materialists on the other, and they were mostly in Europe, the materialists on the other hand uh, became more empirical thinkers and they said, you know what's really real is what we can touch. Matter is really real. And they were mostly in America and England. So even now there is this difference one can notice between continental thought and Anglo-American thought because continental thought 
tends to be having taken the mental side of the divide between mind and matter, and Anglo-American and uh, yeah, Anglo-American thought has taken the more uh, material side. Okay, so uh, Whitehead said, as he looked at this, there's no way to put it together. Absolutely no way. Once Descartes split mind and matter, uh, hundreds of years of thinkers have tried to integrate them, and so he said the only way to solve this problem is to go back behind Descartes be before the split between mind and matter and posit that every actuality without exception is both. Every actuality has a physical pole, the material side, and every actuality has a mental pole. And there are no actualities that are exclusively one or the other. And the reason for this is that once we let Descartes split mind and matter, we can never get them back together again, Bernard. Never. David, this is the most unique and marvelous presentation of process theology I've ever heard or seen attempted. All right, stick Thank around. <laughs> <laughs> stick around. Uh, <laughs> but those are the two things. Process theology means one, moving from, moving from seeing the, when one sees the world, what does one see most? Does one see that which is static or that which is moving? And secondly, when one sees the world, does one see a division between mind and matter, or does one see their uh, unity? Now, <sighs> one time, many years ago, Graham Maxwell, and by the way, Graham Maxwell, Jack Probancha, Dalton Baldwin, who was the fourth one, Will Alexander, all knew process theology very well. A lot of people don't know this, but Will Alexander, who just died, knew process theology very well. He, his favorite process theologian was a man named Daniel Day Williams. And all, all the books that Daniel Day Williams wrote, Will liked the book called The Spirit and Forms of Love the most. And in that book, the chapter Will liked most was a book called Faith, No, Love and Knowledge. And in that book, Daniel Day Williams says, you can't really understand something if you hate it. If you want to understand something, you have to love it. Uh, and so, all I'm trying to say is that, you know, Will and he and I would talk process theology. I think we, he, I probably am the only person on campus who knew that he was very interested in process theology. But remember, he's a bit of a mystic, right? And therefore, Will senses what process theologians sense, that in every moment of every life, God is at work. And we need to be discerning of that. So, okay. How do you put together when Descartes said, I am because I think? You cannot think with the brain. Well, I think that's exactly the problem. The, 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 when he says that, uh, the rest of us are stuck for about 300 years. Uh, we just have to, and I think Whitehead is right about this, we have to go back and say, we refuse to admit the split between mind and matter. We refuse to admit the split between the brain and the mind or the body and the soul. Now, I think you can hear some avenue themes in this. One is freedom. <clears throat> freedom is permeating every aspect of life. My colleague here, uh, Dr. Zuccarelli, talks about us living in an ecology of freedom. Is that your word? <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's absolutely right. The universe is that is something marked by different degrees and uh, forms of freedom. And unless we take that into account, we really can't understand things. And it's encouraging to me that a scientist like Dr. Zuccarelli comes up with this expression that I like so much. We live in an ecology of freedom. Take that seriously and see what that does to your everyday life. It's a very, very powerful idea. So, uh, I'm still working on this idea. So the fundamental things of the universe are instances of um, mind and matter which cannot be distinguished. So I guess we got off to that because the question was what is process theology? So let's get back on, on track here. And I think, the, and I'm happy for the chance to talk about it because I, I can get very emotional about this when I tell you stories about how 
how I've experienced that at work in my own life. I, uh, let me hang on to my emotions here. I'm not very good at that, but let me try. Uh, one night I got up in the middle of the night and I said, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I don't know what it is. And, uh, about a particular person. So, I emailed that person and I said, I can't sleep, I wonder if you're having a rough night too. I didn't hear back. Next day, this person writes back to me, thanks for writing, because after you did, I was able to sleep. There's something working for good in our lives. What did Jesus say? Let those who have eyes, what? See. See. Let those who have ears, hear. We need to be, well, people, I'm looking at John. John Testament can help us. He's promised to help us, and we will schedule him. He can help us to be more discerning. God is at work in every moment of every life, and for the most part, we are blind and deaf to it. All right, so if everything is inspired, we don't ask questions like, is Mozart inspired or Ellen White inspired? They're both inspired. Is the Bible inspired or Plato inspired? They're both inspired. But, what does the Bible say? In which Timothy is it? Um, scripture is given for practical purposes, for instruction, for reproof, for edification. The Bible's role is not that of the only inspired actuality in the universe. The Bible's role is the unquestionable source of practical wisdom for the Christian community. Aristotle had a word called phronesis. It means wisdom, the ability to pull together theory and practice. Good clinicians have that. They've done all the basic science work, um, but over the years, they've developed a hunch as to what goes on in a person's life. Bob Reeves, uh, Donna Carlson's husband, once said to me, Dave, when I walk into a room, it takes me about eight minutes to know what's going on, but then I need to spend time with the patient to help the patient know, know what's going on. There's an intuitive sense. Now, the first person uh, out of medical school is not going to have that intuitive sense, but if you do that year after year after year, you start discerning patterns and tendencies, and you're able to be very, very discerning that's a, that's a very, very important thing. So, Ellen White says this. She said, you know, I get, <laughs> I get criticized for being radical. All I'm doing is telling you what Ellen White says. She says that the person who is making shoes on the hard anvil is doing God's work. The one who is doing business is doing God's work there and then. And I think of us here at Loma Linda equipping laity for ministry. That's our job. We are not equipping clergy. We are equipping, equipping laity. Now, the Bible is unsurpassable. It's unique. It's distinctive. Not because it is the only thing that is inspired, but because it has a specific role that nothing else has. And the best way to understand that, I think, is to think of the Constitution of the United States. That, the Bible, is not the Constitution, but I'm using that as a rough analogy. The Constitution does two things for the United States. One, it creates it. That's why we use the word constitute. No Constitution, no United States. One can, no attention to the Bible, no Christian.
Just as simple as that. Not because the Bible is the only thing inspired, but because the Bible has this distinctive role to play in our life. Now, if you're an American, you can agree with the Constitution, you can disagree with it, you can partially agree, partially disagree, and you can be a good American. What you can't do is say, I don't care what the Constitution says. The minute one says, I don't care what the Constitution says, one is no longer an American. Same way with the Bible. You can agree with it, you can disagree with it. The Bible doesn't require you to believe everything it says. We're the only ones who do that. Uh, the, the, you can agree with it, you can disagree with it, you can partially agree with it, partially disagree with it, but what you can't say is, I don't care what the Bible says. The minute one says that, one is no longer a Christian. One is no longer a Jew. One is no longer a Muslim. The Bible constitutes the community of faith just like the uh, Constitution creates the, the nation. Secondly, though, the Constitution is the place to which all arguments ultimately drive. There is no further argument than to the Constitution. When the Supreme Court says this is constitutional or not constitutional, there's no further court of appeal. That's it. Likewise, in, in the life of the Christian church, everything drives to the Bible. And in the end, that's where the final arguments have to be made, and that's where people have to make the final decisions according to which they will live their lives. So the Bible is like the Constitution in that it creates the community, and it creates the ultimate uh, context for the final conversations and debates within the community. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Then who is our Supreme Court with respect to the Bible? That's where it gets dicey. That's right. Who decides what it is? Well, that's true, though, in, it's, it's true in the nation, isn't it? One we of have the Supreme Court there, but we don't have one here, but we have people who think they are. <laughs> that's right. That, no, that's absolutely right, and that's part of where we're stuck right now. Uh, we are never able to say as human beings that we understand the text or the understand, we understand the will of God with absolute clarity, certainty, and accuracy. We simply cannot say that. We are mere humans. And so we listen to each other, we talk to each other, we try to learn from each other, but in the end, each one of us has to make a decision and live according to that decision. But to try, for us to try to force our wills on others is not appropriate. Uh, just just a one illustration here and then, um, well, let, let me go, just finish this off if I can. This means that when I open any book of any sort, I ask God to help me learn as much as I possibly can from that book. Any book. Any book. And I think God has blessed me in that respect. I think God has helped me to understand a lot of books. And it makes no difference to me whether I open up the book of Job or if I... Uh, but open up um, John Milton that text has something to say to me and I want to know what that is as far as you can in every field of knowledge don't settle for narrow views these are you know these are paraphrases of her her um her words, don't be narrow, don't be provincial. Open up and see, what's the language she uses? Nature and revelation, we would talk about science and religion. Learn everything you can from religion. Learn everything you can from science and put it together. There is a Loma Linda tradition of theology and I've tried really hard to try to figure out what it is, but it goes back at least as far as Arthur Beats down to the present. A lot of you knew Arthur Beats. And, but you, you know, Jack Provencher said his life with Arthur, when he worked for Arthur Beats, that was the happiest period of his life. Uh, Arthur Beats was a powerful, powerful uh, influence. 
what is the Loma Linda tradition? I'm a, Roy used to get very upset when we talk about the Loma Linda tradition because he thought that we were saying we are the only people who think this way. No. We are saying we are amongst those people who think this way. But the Loma Linda tradition, in its own way, is exactly the process thought uh, tradition. Number one, things are on the move. One never tries to freeze things as though they last forever. The Loma Linda tradition is that of movement, 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 movement. Uh, nobody in my, amongst my colleagues has ever said, well, you know, that's not what we used to think and try to stop thinking, stop on uh, that, anything on that basis. Uh, let me say that's what, not what we used to think, and this is why we used to think this, how does this compare to that, and so forth and so on. But movement, 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 movement. Secondly, integration, integration, integration. And I'm using this gesture quite, quite deliberately because one of our new professors, Eric um, Carter, used it at a, at a recent faculty meeting when we were talking about the, the um, theological tradition of Loma Linda, and he was listening as a brand new professor, and finally he said, you know, it just is like this. Religion and science, art and medicine, everything comes together. We aren't in the business of driving wedges between different forms of knowledge. Everything. Everything's moving and everything needs to be integrated. So those are the two things. I end with a story. Did I talk all the time? Did I talk the whole time? Okay. Ten, time? Ten past eleven. Oh, so we have some time for discussion. Uh, one day, many years ago, in the early 1970s, Graham Maxwell came to our faculty meeting, sat down at the end of the table, and he pulled out a letter from his inside the pocket. And he said, I've received a letter from Ted. Who's Ted? Neil's son. Graham and Neil were classmates. And Graham said, I thought you'd like to read it. Hear me read it to you. Now, Ted Wilson had just started his ministry in New York. And it was a theological reproof of Graham Maxwell. So here you have this young man who, starting his ministry, felt authorized to reprove Graham Maxwell theologically. What had happened is that Ted Wilson had been in a library there and seen that Loma Linda had helped sponsor a conference with some people at Claremont, and he thought that, that was being unequally yoked with unbelievers. He didn't realize that we have common concerns about overcoming dualism and also talking about uh, the integration, no, I'm repeating myself, overcoming dualism, talking about the flow of things and emphasizing God's love rather than God's power as a unifying theme for all of Christian thought. So Adventists and those people, not everybody at Claremont, but Adventists and those people at Claremont had a common interest on these three themes that were distinctively Adventist themes and Elder Wilson, who, the man who's now Elder Wilson, took it upon himself without understanding what he was talking about. Reprove Graham Maxwell. And I, you know, I was very young. I came here when I was 27. Oh, and I sat there and I listened to this. And I wondered, I wondered how Graham would respond. Because it seemed to me so arrogant. And it seemed to me so uninformed that I marveled that he would do that. So I waited. Everybody around the table waited. Then Graham folded it up and he said, <laughs> That was it. <laughs> That's all. Okay, somebody wants to say something. The big idea is God is in everything, everywhere, but how God is functioning everywhere and uh, in any particular place varies. That's why I have no trouble talking about God inspiring Ellen White. Of course God inspired Ellen White. Of course. No doubt about it. Anybody who can do as much good in her life as she did, 
uh, was responding to God's presence in her life in very profound ways. Perfect by no means. By no means. But God used her. Thank you, and publicly thank you for today. This has been inspiring, literally. Um, a thought, nowhere near the depth that you've done, but maybe a little shallow part oh, of this. But um, I've often wondered whether the whole notion of um, God inspiring, and you've really expanded that word, whether God, exp uh, the top-down method, um, I've, I've, I've just tried to think about the inadequacies or, or the limitations of that and I've allowed myself to be a, a bit apostate maybe and to think maybe it's actually bottom up and that uh, the way God, the human agency, in other words, the way God seems to me to work in the world is when it deals with other people, only through people. I mean, I know there's this thing that we conceptualise called the Holy Spirit, but I've never seen it, and I don't know it. I, I, I'm not saying it's not there, but I don't know how it works. But what I do know is that intelligent, thoughtful, dedicated, holy, um, you know, men and women of God as they think about the journey towards God, um, they, that's the only way that love can be expressed on this planet. It's from people to people. I mean, you can make all these sort of statements about, well, God loves us there. Well, I mean, but the way it gets worked out is it's people doing it. People take <coughs> care of each other. Or people become intolerant. We've got to refine that. Or people become... Uh, horrific holocaust and we've got to refine that and see the error of that and the enormity of the evil. So I've, I've tried to wonder whether inspiration isn't in fact people as they think about God uh, write, express, lecture, tell, do stuff um, and then over a period of time we get to think about that and reflect on it, uh, alter it, refine it, change it. Um, and I'm actually a little bit comfortable, maybe too comfortable, with the fact that uh, the script, and I'll go to the scriptures now, the, the scriptures as an expression of God's inspiration are good people, holy people, reflecting on God, uh, applying it the best way they could. Uh, and that we have the moral obligation to sort of refine, think about, apply, change, um, whatever we do with that uh, as we move forward. I know that's a sort of a simple sidebar to what you're saying, but what do you think of that? I don't, I don't regard it as a simple sidebar. I think it's uh, very, very profound. And I'd like to begin by saying I think you have seen the Holy Spirit at work. I think you've seen committee meetings that were locked tight, just locked tight. How can we, and then someone makes a suggestion and moves forward. Mm -hmm. As a clinician, you've seen people whose lives have been mangled by misfortunes of all sorts, but you've seen within them a remarkable grasping for wholeness. Right? Have you not seen that? Sure. Uh, that's, that's the Holy Spirit's work. We never see the Holy Spirit as such, but you, you've seen it. Everybody in this room has had moments when they have seen breakthroughs, insights. Uh, somebody was listening. Somebody was hearing that there's a better way to do this. This business we are in, um, this is a sidebar, and this is a sidebar, but you know, we are stuck on this women's of ordination, women of ordination thing because our leaders have so little imagination. They think the only options are either to allow disobedience or to coerce 
obedience. There are a thousand other ways to deal with this issue, but there's no imagination. It's all just stuck right there. I, I want to continue, and then I'll come back. So, you have seen it. We've all seen it. Uh, and God never works except in incarnate ways. That's, and I, I sometimes say we grow up when we stop thinking of God being fully involved in some experiences and start thinking about God partially involved in all experiences. That's, that's a step in the direction of moral maturity. All right, so yes, uh, we see this in the Bible where the people who were building the sanctuary and bringing the goldsmiths and, and the people cutting down the trees, they're all inspired by God. The Bible says they are. Uh, that's response to the first part of what you said. What was the other part? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, oh, oh I, I think I was just... Um, focusing more on, and maybe it's a bit too humanistic, but on the human agency part of it, that that's the only way God works, I think, through, from when we have to deal with people, it's through other people. So, I, 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 I think I'm uh, encouraged that um, uh, inspiration, maybe a little more closer to you, than, and it's just using a different metaphor, but Inspiration is is not so much top down but bottom up. I think I think it's not so much top down and bottom up. It's also more inside than outside. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For us now, yeah. if that's all I'd said, I'd be a pantheist. Mm -hmm. But that's not all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that God is more than what the presence of God inside me. But there is that of God, like the Quakers say, there is that which is of God in each and one of us, every organism. So we tend to think that, that the Holy Spirit's out there and then every so often sort of penetrates. No, the Holy Spirit has, is at work within all of us in every moment of our lives. If only we would see it. And you know, life is hard. Life is hard. And we get into very difficult circumstances and it seems we don't know what to do, but there are always ways to improve things at least a little bit if only we will be sensitive to God's presence in our lives. Yes, ma'am. I don't even know if this is exactly on point, but what you were saying about lack of imagination, several weeks ago there was an Association of Adventist Women meeting at La Sierra, and I think maybe some people here went to it. I had an unusual experience in that Jack and I spent a year uh, at Sir Run Run Shaw Hospital. And before we went, someone put me in contact with a young Chinese woman who was studying theology at uh, Andrews University. And lo and behold, there she is at the, at the uh, meeting last month. And she is the pastor of a very, apparently a large church in Beijing. Uh, she's the senior pastor. One of the things she said was that God loves diversity. And any attempt to force unity, force um, likeness, is, is against him. And I thought that was very interesting. Then I was reading a book, it's not a new book, I, it's uh, Jacques Ducan, maybe I'm not pronouncing his name right, right. But it's a book on Daniel. And he, yeah. he traces the forcing of uniformity, this lack of imagination, from the Tower of Babel, when we're, we've all got this one language and this one purpose and we can just do anything. He brings it down to the point at which Nebuchadnezzar is trying to force everybody to go through the rote, commanded obeisance to his golden statue. And Nukon says again, um, to force unity is satanic, um, to allow freedom, that's, that's the real, and change and movement, I guess. That's the real religion from God. So it's, I just wonder, I don't know how old he was, I don't know if he's still alive, oh, but yeah. I'm sure he was at the seminary. What happened to that thinking? What happened to that thinking? Where did it go? Well, there was a big change in the seminary faculty um, along the way, and that's, that's a big story unto itself. 
But Jacques Lacan is a Jewish man. Yes, I know. He is a Christian man and a specialist in the First Testament of the Bible. I think he's written the best book written by anybody on Jewish-Christian relations. <coughs> his book on, on that is better than anything else I've read. Uh, and his daughter is a philosopher in New York City. So that's a very, very helpful. I'm glad you found value in that book. Um, but the Holy Spirit was at work in China all the years that yes. we weren't there. Yes. And they were doing just fine, thank you, right? <laughs> they didn't need us to tell them what to do. She kept saying, God could have chosen any man, but he chose me. That's right. And the work, the Adventist work in China is flourishing. Yes. The best thing we can do is let God lead them, stay out yes. of the way. Absolutely. Yes, Peter, and then we can. Thank you for sharing with us your thoughts about the inspiration and about the process theology, especially about the inspiration of the Bible. And when we were talking, it came to my mind uh, some very interesting, beautiful words uh, of one of the fathers of the church from the fourth century, uh, Diodorus of uh, Tarsus. I know the name, but I haven't read it. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Well, he said that the Bible is teaching us what is useful, and uh, it's uh, exposing what is sinful and correcting what is deficient. In this way, it's perfecting the human beings. Right, right. To me, it's all so beautiful, so, yeah, yeah. so memorable. Right. And also thinking about... I like that. Yeah, because I understood that you are advocating uh, unity and diversity, if I understood you correctly, in reading the Bible and about yeah, everything. Yeah, right. Yes. And uh, it came to my mind that it may be that uh, the fathers of the church, the way in which they were looking at inspiration, uh, the Bible, it can help us how to read the Bible and how to interpret it. And uh, they, they were reading the Bible holistically. They were reading the Bible Christologically, communally, contextually, and participatory. Wow. And I, I can say a few words about uh, each one. Um, when they were talking about holistically, they were talking about the whole Bible, taking it as a unit, not the Old Testament, the New Testament. And they were talking about Christologically to, to look at it, Christ the center of the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. Communally, they were reading and interpreting the, the, the Bible in the church. Mm -hmm. Contextually, of course, they were looking at the context, not picking up different texts from all over to make the point. Mm -hmm. And participatory, to participate, not only to read. And uh, I was thinking at how Augustine looked at this problem when uh, he said that uh, we should not only read Christ was crucified, but we should say also in a participatory way, I was crucified with Christ and I was resurrected with him. Paul said that too, right? Yeah. Thank you. Let me ask you a quick question and it forces uh, needing to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, now, the author you mentioned, Greek tradition or Latin tradition? It's both, basically. Okay. Well, of course, Augustine, it's... it's uh, well, yeah, that's Latin. But right, first, right. Uh, and Diodorus, I think he's uh, Eastern. Uh, I think so, too. The right. reason I... The, I think he's part of the Eastern tradition. Right. And the reason I mention that is that John Wesley, who is our spiritual grandfather, said we ought to read more from the early Greek fathers. Right. He thought we were reading too much from the Latin fathers and the legal, right, forensic, substitutionary, that sort of thing. Right. But we need to go over to the Greek fathers where there's a much more therapeutic uh, cluster of metaphors about how God relates to the universe. So Wesley was pointing us in the same direction you're pointing us. And I think we ought to take that very, very seriously. Yes, because they are considering the doctors of the church both from the East and from the West. Yes, yes but Wesley said we need to pay more attention to the ones from the East. Right. Pay too much attention right. to the ones from the West. Just want to say, Randy Roberts' sermon this morning was really on the same thing, where we talked about seeing, just now, talked about seeing God <coughs> is involved in all events, all books, and this kind of thing. Randy Roberts talked about, uh, in preaching from Habakkuk, uh, interesting text, now he used it, 
um, that God is in all people. And whereas we tend to draw lines in the sand, it's the other side who is evil and we are good. And I used a number of sort of very tentative analogies toward the results of this election and so forth. And then people's tendency to draw evil is over there, we are the good guys, regardless of which side you were on in this, uh, that God is at work in all people. That's right. And there is no one in whom God cannot be at work, even those we think are on the wrong side. Right. So that's kind of I, I like the question of the same thing. That's yes. a perfect illustration. As a nation, uh, we are in a tight spot and people think we have only two alternatives. There are a thousand alternatives that will move our nation in a healing direction. And we need to be amongst those who are finding those creative solutions instead of returning again and again to the old, worn out patterns when God is inviting us to do something new and better. Thank you very much, David. And as I have been now engraved in poetry, Time's up. <laughs> okay, next week we're going to have our uh, presentation on the books, and then in uh, December, uh, Leo Ranzelin will be pre taking his presentations, and we're going to have you come back at, at a future date, so uh, we appreciate it. Don't forget, tonight at 7.30 at the Orton Center will be Miroslav Wolf, or Wolf, I don't know, pronounce that W or V. Uh, he. Hmm? He. He. Well, I tell you what, I was in Pennsylvania Dutch country, and a lot of times those people use those uh, those wizards. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, speaking tonight at the uh, Orton Center at the University of Redlands, and then also 6:30 tonight, the book club is going to be looking at uh, Brian Dubinsma's book, uh, Facing Doubt, and so. Uh, you have before you our benediction. Let's read this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And have a good Thanksgiving. You'll be around just a little bit if someone wants to talk to you, David.